Hello and welcome to Man Up to Anthropos. Myths, facts and solutions. I'm your host, Dr. Lo Chai Ling, and today we have a very special guest, Dr. Derek Ko. Dr. Ko is an accomplished physician with over 20 years of experience in both public and private healthcare sectors in Singapore. He specializes in preventative and family medicine, health and wellness screening, and is a strong advocate for healthy aging. Dr. Ko's practice focuses in functional medicine, providing tailored health screenings and wellness programs, including the management of andropause. He's also board certified in anti-aging and has completed extensive training in practical andrology and nutritional protocols. In today's episode, we will dive deep into the topic of male andropause, clearing up common Miss discussing factual information and exploring practical solutions. Whether you're experiencing symptoms yourself or looking to support a loved one, this episode is packed with valuable insights. So let's get started. Well, it's so nice having you with us, Dr. Derek. And one of um, the questions a lot of my patients ask me is what are the signs and symptoms of male andropause? I would describe it as a decline in three aspects of their life, mm -hmm. right? The physical aspect, the mm -hmm. mental aspect, mm -hmm. and um, the sexual aspect. Okay. So in terms of physical aspect, there would probably be a decline in physical energy. Okay. Certainly a reduction in muscles, an increase in body fat, mm. and uh, if they were to check, probably a decrease in bone density. Ah, uh, okay. Um, for the mental aspect, it could vary from very mild, I'm just feeling down, mm. you know, to outright depression and anxiety. Right? Okay. And a lot of my patients who are still working in their 50s and 60s, mm. they may find that this decline in their mental oomph, their mm. mental motivation, would prevent them from, you know, performing well at their workplace. Okay. And then lastly, which is probably the reason why a lot of men look for me, yeah. would be the decline in sexual health, right? The loss uh. of sex drive and certainly erectile dysfunction. Okay. But I understand this is a very slow decline, right? It is not a sudden, you know, it, it mm. isn't like a, uh, my boyfriend hit 45 and bought a Ferrari. Is that a sign of mm. andropause? Mm. Yeah. I mean, that, that could be a sign <laughs> of a uh, middle age crisis, men right. uh, andropause. But, but you're right. I think um, the difference between andropause and menopause is that while menopause is a rather rapid decline, mm. andropause uh, takes its time, right? Mm. It may or may not happen. So while menopause will happen to all women, mm. andropause does not happen to all men. Oh, so some men actually don't go through mm. andropause? We we run a health screening center, mm. right? And uh, we do testosterone levels mm. for our patients. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I have men in the seventies with impressive testosterone levels. Oh. And okay. I have men in their thirties and forties with very dismal levels. So what you're trying to say is actually andropause can occur quite at varied times for men. It can mm. be a decline anywhere from 30 all the way to 70, but there is no fixed age. Whereas for women, we always say yes. menopause, where you're looking at late 40s to yeah. early 50s, in, correct? In menopause is probably like a biological clock. Mm. For, mm. for men, it's influenced by many other factors. So what are the main factors that will make somebody in the 30s have low testosterone and someone in the 70s still full of, full of vigor and testosterone? Uh, probably neglect. <laughs> neglect, neglect, by the... neglect, neglect by the patients okay. towards their lifestyle, their right. lifestyle choices. So for patients in the 30s and the 40s who have low testosterone, mm. I find that a lot of times the main contributing reason would be weight. Okay. They, they tend to be overweight and the other contributing reason would be stress. Right. That's something that most of us can't escape. I see. Mm. So the two main and Im most important factors you think is weight and stress. How about other things like um, smoking, lots of alcohol? I think when we talk about andropause, we don't just talk about the testosterone level. Mm. Right? We talk about symptoms in general. Mm. So when I treat a patient, I don't treat the level. Okay. I mean, if I bring his testosterone up from a low level to a high level, but yes. he's still feeling depressed, mm. you know, he's still having minimal muscle mass, still feeling fat, uh -huh. you know, that's probably of minimal use okay. for the patient, right? Yeah. It is not yeah. just treating the testosterone, mm. right? We've got, we've got to approach the patient holistically. Uh. Uh, we've got to, you know, manage factors that contribute to his symptoms. Okay. Right? So, you know, if the patient is overweight, yeah. the, my first advice would not be, you know, let's start some testosterone replacement. Okay. My, my advice would be, let's start you on a weight loss program. Okay. You know, talk to him about his exercise, his lifestyle choices, yeah. <laughs> the, the foods he take, the yeah. calorie intake and all that. Okay. Right? Mm. But one of the big problems my male patients face is that as they get older, they tell me they actually have 
problems losing weight. So it becomes a vicious cycle, isn't it? They find yeah. it harder and harder yeah. to lose weight and you're saying that the weight itself contributes to the symptoms of andropause. So what mm. does a man do then? Okay, I, I think it is still, it, it, it'll get harder as we grow older for yeah. both men and women, right? But yeah. it is still possible. And I, I think, you know, the very traditional ways of losing weight, mm. creating a calorie deficit, mm. but, keep, but keeping the nutrition adequate okay. uh, and exercising yeah. would help to speed up the process. Okay, and so we it's talk still about, about a calorie deficit, the and, traditional and way. Burning the cal- and okay. burning the calories. Right, right. And, right. Uh, burning the calories is not just, you know, I, I cycle 40 kilometers or I run, a, I train for a marathon. Mm. Uh, that will burn calories while you're exercising. Mm. But I think it's important for my patients, um, including my male patients, yeah. to engage in some sort of uh, resistance training. Okay, so weight training. Yeah, is there a minimum number of times a week a man should engage in weight training? I think if he recovers quickly, <laughs> he can exercise almost every other day or every day. Right, right. right. But, uh, but most of us at that age would probably need one day to recover. Okay. Yeah. The other way to go around this is to probably exercise different body parts. Okay. So I may want to do my leg exercise today. Oh, you know? that's actually very And then very tomorrow, smart. My, my chest and my back is feeling good. So yes. I exercise my back and then following okay. another day, my, my shoulders or whatever. Okay. And then you mentioned a calorie deficit. But then to build muscle, they will still mm. need adequate protein. Yes. Is so there like I, a protein level you ask them to yes. hit? So, so there, are, there, are two, there are two things about a calorie deficit. Mm. We create a calorie deficit, but mm-hmm. we want our nutrients to be kept optimal. Okay. Right? And when we talk about the nutrients, we're talking about, you know, besides your minerals and your vitamins, mm. I, I think protein is a very important okay. aspect in muscle building and yeah. also boosting up your testosterone levels. Yeah. How much protein would you say, you know, off the cuff, would you advise your men to mm-hmm. take? One gram per kg, is that enough? Oh, that would probably be in the, the bare minimum. Right, right? But, okay. But sometimes yeah. one gram per kg, I would usually suggest one gram per pound maybe. Even okay. one, one gram per pound. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Oh. I think the, the suggested you know, daily allowance will be 40 grams. But okay. that would not be very useful for my men who are in yeah. a calorie deficit trying yes. to build muscles. Okay. Mm. So you don't ask them to abstain from any food, uh, no special diet, just as long as the macronutrients are optimal, mm. they are in some sort of calorie deficit, it mm. should be okay. I, I think there, while there could be some food that may potentially increase testosterone levels, but mm. I think, you know, back to basics, a holistic, a wholesome diet, right? So the diet that I recommend my patients would usually be the Mediterranean diet. Okay. Right. So they stress lots of vegetables, lots of fruits, mm. you know, minimal processed food. Okay. Uh, meats in the form of fish and chicken. Right? Wow. Okay. Uh, for patients with no cholesterol issue, you know, uh, mm. they may want to embark on a caveman diet, right? A paleo okay. diet where they concentrate more on the meats to build up their muscle mass. Ah. Okay. Yeah. But right. if they've got a cholesterol issue then that's probably not the best okay. diet to follow. Are you on any of these diets yourself? I try to be on a Mediterranean diet. Okay. Yeah. And you find that that's very useful for your weight. I it think has helped. I think that keeps my cholesterol well controlled. That keeps my weight, my weight mm. well controlled. And okay. I, I do check my testosterone every year. And okay. I think it's fairly impressive compared to my patients. Okay. Yeah. So uh, back to the diet before we go to the testosterone. How about alcohol? A lot of men will ask me, do I have to give up drinking? Be a tea totaler. I, I love my drinks. Yeah. <laughs> so I would never tell my patients not yeah. to drink. Um, but I think everything in moderation and mm. also depending on the profile of the patient, right? Yeah. So if I were to see a patient who is not overweight and during the screening process, I find that he's got no fatty mm. liver, you know, and when I do a hormone panel, mm. including his estrogen levels, yeah. I find that the estrogen levels are well within the range. Yeah. Then, yeah, he can probably drink a couple of units per week, right? Okay. But let's say if I see an obese patient that I'm trying to get to lose weight to increase his testosterone, mm. You know, and he's got concurrent fatty liver. Then you, know, you then, are going to be yeah, stricter. Then I will be stricter. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, back to that question that everybody wants to ask about uh, is, yeah, how do you measure testosterone level? Like, mm. so it's probably a blood test and can you replace it safely? Because, you know, there's so much information on the internet mm. out there that mm. you can and then some people say no, they are at risk. What, what are your views mm. on testosterone replacement? Okay, so first of all, how do we test it, mm. right? It's a simple blood test. We mm. can check the total testosterone okay. or if you want to be more accurate, you can check the free testosterone. Okay. Right? Um, as for treatment, there are, um, there are lots of misconceptions about treatment and I think one mm. of the biggest misconceptions will be, you know, mm. testosterone, testosterone replacement causing cancers yeah. and maybe even testosterone replacement causing heart attacks and stroke, right? Mm. And I think that is true 
if you abuse steroids, right? So we've got young bodybuilders who abuse steroids, they will suffer the consequence because they're not following protocol. Okay. But if I were to replace a patient who is lacking in testosterone and mm -hmm. I will bring the testosterone up to a reasonable level, yeah. then I think there will be minimal uh, side effects. Okay. So does the testosterone, you know, like uh, women hormones, does it fluctuate over the course of a month? So when we take, mm. say, a free mm. T4 and total testosterone, do we have to repeat mm. the test? Yeah. So un unlike women, whereby mm. the estrogen and progesterone will vary depending on whether this is a luteal phase or follicular yeah. phase, for men, the testosterone is quite consistent. Mm. But usually when I advise a patient to monitor his testosterone, I'll tell him to come during the same time. I see. Day. So if you saw me in the morning and, and did the blood test in the morning, the next time come back in the morning. Okay. If he does it in the afternoon, then come back in the afternoon. So who is a candidate for testosterone replacement? As long as your testosterone is within the normal but low range or does it have to be abnormally low for mm. you to replace? So um, let's use total testosterone as a yardstick, mm. right? Um, the range varies depending on the lab, 5 plus yeah. to maybe up to 30. Okay. Right? But the... Guidelines regards treatment. I mm. think anybody below 12, okay. if they are symptomatic, okay. would benefit from treatment. What if they are not symptomatic, but you can uh, catch on the blood test that it's mm, low? I think if they are not symptomatic and their screening does not show you know, anything worrisome, you know, they are not osteoporotic either, you mm. know, they, they have bigger physically, they are bigger mm. mentally, then I see less need for treatment. I see, okay. So like I said, we treat not the number, but we treat the patient. The symptoms. Yeah. And how is it being replaced? Is it injection or is it a mm. cream? I think I think replacement comes in many forms. Mm. The the easiest one I feel would mm. be the injections. So there is a two weekly inje injection called Sustanol. Mm -hmm. There is a three monthly injection called Nebido. Oh, okay. We can also apply creams. Yeah. So there's a cream testosterone that is also quite safe. Okay. Uh, in the past, some doctors would use oral testosterone, mm. but um, because of the first pass effect on the liver, okay. uh, it tends to be less effective. I see. Mm. So, are there any pros and cons of using either the injections versus the creams? Maybe the creams are less easy to measure, measure out the exact quantity, right? I believe the creams come in a sachet, oh, yeah, okay. so it's quite straightforward. Mm. But uh, So, it, it depends a lot on my patient. If my yeah. patient you know, is adverse regards a needle, yeah. then probably applying a cream, right? Okay. But if my patient is not adverse, then I think applying a cream on a daily basis is uh, quite troublesome. Right. Mm. Then besides testosterone, when you replace testosterone, are there any other um, uh, levels that you have to watch out for and other things that you have to replace? Or is it just straightforward testosterone? Mm, I think when we replace testosterone, I think bef before we, I think before we even replace testosterone, mm. there are probably a few checks that we need to yes. do. Yes. Right. So if we suspect that the patient has prostate cancer, it mm. is a big no no, right? Yeah. So normally when I screen the patient, a potential patient for testosterone treatment, yeah. I, besides checking the hormone panel, yeah, I would check his PSA level. Okay. I would do a digital examination of his prostate. Yeah. I would very lightly check his uh, full blood counts. Uh, okay. If a patient has a high hematocrit, yeah. it may be dangerous to jab him with testosterone right. because that will increase the hematocrit yes. even more. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. because a lot of my patients who have low testosterone tend to be obese, yeah. maybe even sleep apnea, mm, then you mm. know, the hematocrit occasion is occasion. Yeah, actually sleep apnea becomes very common with men as they get older, but mm. maybe it's all part of these obesity mm. vicious cycle. Mm. Yeah. I think obesity is a central cause. Is a central cause, yeah, you think? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what, are the, what is a typical patient that you see in your clinic that comes in mm. for andropause? How old and how do they usually present? I think I've, over the years, I've mm. seen patients as young as 30s. Mm. Right? I, I, I would not call them andropausal, mm. but they have low testosterone, they've okay. got low energy. But I think this is probably secondary low testosterone yeah. um, because of their weight. Right, and uh, uh, these patients will probably benefit from some weight loss advice, yeah. maybe even weight loss medication rather than mm. you know testosterone therapy. Mm. Then I have patients in the forties and fifties who find that despite exercising, mm. you know they are losing their energy level, they are losing mm. their muscle mass, they can't recover. Yeah, and uh, if these patients have low testosterone, yeah. you know, and they are symptomatic, then I will probably treat them with testosterone fairly soon. Yeah. Mm. It sounds like low energy is one of the um, common presenting complaints mm. of men, right? Mm. How about other symptoms? Are there other ways they can present it that may not be low energy? Mm. Low sex drive. I mentioned okay. low sex drive, low motivation. Um, and, and some men, especially those who exercise frequently, yeah. um, are a little bit bothered if they start putting on, you know, 
because of fat and muscles and they mm. want to treat testosterone not because they feel more tired or because they feel depressed but because they are their body morphology is changing i right? see mm -hmm. okay and then you know with the low sex drive is it more like they are not interested in sex or they want to have sex and they cannot perform so is both, there a difference both, from both sexual actually, dysfunction yeah. so so one one would be sex drive the other one the other one would be erectile dysfunction so we are talking about sex drive being very um correlated to your mm. hormone levels I, see. I mean i suppose sex drive is also correlated to your mental state right yes. but uh, hormone levels is one of the things okay for erectile dysfunction it is probably you know more complicated it's mm. not just hormonal it could yeah. be vascular it could be psychological okay mm. so are there ways to treat it i mean if you're saying somebody comes in with low sex drive or sexual dysfunction does losing weight or treating the testosterone level correct this or do you actually maybe use other ways of mm. treating so i think if the patient comes with low sex drive mm. as the main complaint but when he wants to engage in intimacy there's no problem yeah then i think you know one of the considerations will be increasing his testosterone by whatever means right okay. we can do it through lifestyle changes we mm. can do it through, through testosterone replacement but if a patient comes in with uh, erectile dysfunction yeah then i would tend to investigate a little bit okay um before deciding to you know replace his testosterone so mm. even if he had low testosterone i may do the usual you know risk factors for cardiovascular disease yes you know check his lipids check okay. his blood pressure check his sugar levels right right yeah, before before deciding on treatment okay and if all those are normal there will be options for treatment for these patients that yes. means you I mean, know I, it's so, so for someone with uh, erectile dysfunction i think in, in my practice i find that just replacing his testosterone would usually not work 100% right mm. so he will still require some medication okay. uh, like Viagra, like Cialis. And are, are those generally safe you think for men to be taking I mean obviously mm. if they are going to be taking that kind of medicine it's going to be taken uh, regularly or at least mm. repeatedly do mm. you think are there any side effects I, you have I to think be for about? the profile of patients that I'm talking about, mm. they will not be taking it so regularly. Oh, right? okay. Because their, their sex drive is low to begin with. That's just what they but I thought you were going to correct it, oh, you yeah, see, yeah. so with the higher sex drive. Mm. I, I think the main contraindication <laughs> yeah. to these drugs would still yeah. be your, your nitrates, right? Your, yeah. your sorbitrates. So okay. if they're not on those, you know, then it's not absolute contraindication. I don't see much harm. As long as they probably continue their health screening and yeah, all that, right? right? Yeah. Then mm. one other symptom I thought you mentioned that was interesting was that the men actually experience depression and now that's surprising to me because men don't actually mm. talk very much about depression maybe it's just not something men talk about but is do you do you find that it's a increasing mm. symptom uh, mm. that's more prevalent in men that are older i think my judgment would be a little bit skewed right okay. because i'm running a you know preventive mm health screening mm. uh, practice and yeah. we're doing you know testosterone replacement so i think yeah. men see me with the agenda so they will tend to voice out right, right they will right. read up yeah. and they will know what to tell me mm -hmm. but but i think when i see someone with depression you mm. know without any other symptoms mm. i would not you know jump straight to you know your andropausal okay probably do some psych workup okay and uh, maybe do some other look at his lifestyle and all that also okay yeah. right so a man that is more naggy as he gets older, that's not a sign of andropause. It, it no, could that, just that, be... Oh yeah, that could be. It's very multifactorial. Right? It's very yeah, multifactorial. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And um, so for all these men who see you, when they come and see you, they probably don't know about testosterone therapy, right? So they're mm. just seeing you for health screening. So two, two sets of patients. Patients who see me for health screening and then by the way, you know, mm. they may voice out certain symptoms. And, yeah. and another subset of patients see me specifically because they suspect that they have low testosterone. Oh. Oh, okay. So for the patients who see me for screening, yeah. who may not have heard of, you know, andropause, yeah. um, sometimes when they may they may sort of, you know, attribute these symptoms to just just aging. Yeah, just and, getting and older. I, and I think it's I yeah. think it's true. Like, these symptoms are actually yeah. aging symptoms, right? Yeah. Mm. But so it's also good to know that they can actually optimize their health. They don't have to exactly. accept these symptoms of be aging because yes. there's so many things you can do now. Mm. Like you you are saying rightly that you have a 70 year old who is very high testosterone. Mm. So I presume he must be having a lot of sex and exercising mm. and not gaining weight. So it doesn't mean exactly. that when you get older, you must put on weight mm. and have mm. no sex, right? Well, you know, I do have a lot of middle-aged men. I don't know if their weight is actually going up, but they tend to have a bigger belly. Yeah, belly fat, yeah. And they will say that um, they don't feel they are eating more, but it all accumulates around the mid-region. Mm. Is there a reason I, I think why? I think that happens to 
uh, most men mm. when their testosterone drops okay. and when their estrogen increase, right? Okay. So when you're estrogen dominant for a male, you mm. tend to put on a lot of fat at the, at the waistline. Yeah, okay. Mm. A, a lot of men don't even realize they actually have estrogen mm. uh, oh, yes, in yes, your blood yes. and women actually have testosterone mm. also, yeah. Okay, and is the, what can they do about this? Again, a bit, a bit chicken and egg mm. because you know, to reduce estrogen effectively, yeah. uh, weight loss is very important, right? Mm. But a little bit chicken and egg because yeah. it's hard to lose weight when you've got high estrogen, right? Yeah. Um, there are medications. There are medications to block the conversion of testosterone to estrogen. I okay. use this very carefully, but yeah. there are medications like Arimidex which can drop, which can prevent testosterone from converting to estrogen. But why would these men have high estrogen, you think? What are the reasons? Lifestyle. Okay. So I Again, think lifestyle. You know, lifestyle, the, the, the fat cells that they have and uh, for some patients, maybe the amount of alcohol that they drink. Uh, so alcohol would actually increase estrogen? Oh yes, alcohol enough. certainly increases estrogen. Is there a particular type of alcohol that increases estrogen more than the next, like beer? <laughs> I, I would love to know if there is, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. I, but I and think, wine I think, is okay. I think it's, uh, alcohol, alcohol. Yeah. Right, right, mm. right. Okay, so soy, basically... Soy also. Soy, so soy, maybe yeah. the man should not take so much soy and mm. don't if, take alcohol. If, if he wants to get his protein intake in, you know, yeah. get in the form of, you know, fish protein, you know, mm. lean meat protein rather than soy protein. Yeah. You know? And are you an advocate of protein supplements? Are all these protein powders that I see all these men taking? I think our Asian diet is could potentially be quite lacking in protein. Yeah. I mean, if I were to go and, you know, take a bowl of fried noodles outside, yeah. you know, the little bits of yeah, I can't imagine. Or that, <laughs> quite little. So it depends on the yeah. diet, right? Mm. If if you are eating a fair amount of protein, yeah. um, you know, then I think there is no need for protein supplementation. Okay. Unless, unless you have a goal, right? I mean, if your mm. goal is to build more muscles, then yes, optimize your protein, take okay. as much as it's safe, you know, but mm. uh, if not, then I don't think it's that necessary. Okay. But, but if you're otherwise taking a diet that is less in protein, you know, mm. if your morning breakfast is uh, a cup of coffee and a kaya toast, you know, your lunch is maybe, you know, soup noodles with a mm. little bit of cha siu, uh, yeah. then I think, yes, protein supplementation will be useful. Will be useful, mm. right? Especially if they're doing resistance training. Yes, precisely. Yeah. Yes. Is there a time to actually take all these kind of protein supplements or increase your protein? Uh, like, do you have to do it within how many hours of your mm. resistance training for it to be most yeah. effective? I, I think take it, I mean, I, I would suggest taking it around the time of your training, okay. you know, before yeah. or after. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's interested in mm -hmm. endopause. How about creatinine? Creatinine can improve muscle recovery. Okay. Right. Creatinine can improve muscle mass. Okay. So I think it is safe. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Say, you know, say my dad, he probably has low testosterone because he has all the symptoms you listed. Mm. He's grouchy, probably doesn't have sex with my mom mm. anymore. Mm. And if I want to send him for testosterone injections, how long can this last for? I mean, there must be a limit to how long we can offer these treatments. Mm. Mm. I, I tell my patients that, you know, if they do not change their lifestyle mm. very much, then they're going to be my patients for life, right? And it's safe uh -huh. to keep taking it, it testosterone is, It is safe injections? because we are following a certain protocol. We, okay. are not, we are not overdosing these patients. So you all, so you have to keep measuring the blood to after the injections mm. to make sure that it's still within yeah. a physiological. So, so limits. taking into account the half time of the medication, okay. you know, like for Nebidol, it is suggested on a three monthly basis. Ah, okay. So if you follow a three monthly routine of Nebidol injection, then mm. it is very unlikely that you will run into complications. And you know, people who take these uh, testosterone injections, what is the first thing they tell you they experience? Like, you know, is it miraculous? Do they suddenly, I don't know. Look like Ryan Gosling. Uh, I think, the, again, depending on the gender, right? I, I just saw a patient this morning. Yeah. Right? I just saw a patient this morning. He had low testosterone. And I think he's, he saw me mainly because of a low mood. Right? Okay. Muscle-wise, he was okay. Fat-wise, he was okay. Right? Mental-wise, uh, yes, a bit, of, a bit of depression even, right? Mm. But uh, no reason for the depression, right? No ah, work stress okay. or no relationship right, stress. Right, or. right, And um, today was his third injection and he feels much better and he wants to continue. Okay. Mm. Did he say in what way does he feel better? Mainly mentally that he's not so depressed mm, and good. more energy. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so it's not actually, it's not, it doesn't take that long to see results. I mean, as soon as the mm. third injections, you're already seeing yes. some improvement because in for, all your symptoms. That's right. I mm. mean, for the injections, we, we the, the usual protocol will be to inject once every three months. Yeah. But the second dose is given six weeks after the first injection. I we, see. We call that a booster dose, right? I see. And uh, if I were to measure, and I do measure my mm. patient's testosterone sometimes after yeah. the booster dose, I find that 
occasionally it exceeds the normal reference rate. Oh, okay. right? But I always assure my patients that that will only be for a while because after yes. that it's going to drop back again. Ah, okay. So even men who find it difficult to lose weight after the injections, they should find that it's easier to lose weight, easier to build muscle perhaps? But I think they would still need to address their lifestyle. Yes. Because one of the problems with injecting testosterone for my overweight patient mm. is that I would concurrently increase his estrogen. Ah. Testosterone is converted yes. to estrogen in the fat cells. Yes. You give him more testosterone, it gets aromatized to estrogen. So what do we do about that conundrum? Um, I would stress diet, very strict diet, calorie deficit, exercise both resistance and yep. cardiovascular. Um, and occasionally I'll prescribe them some medication. The to, estrogen blocker. Yes, the estrogen blocker. I see. And that is taken orally when as as long as they are having the injections yes, then they take right. the estrogen. Are there yeah. side effects to that medicine? Again, we are giving a very conservative dose. Okay. So no side effects. Yeah, so so it clearly shows testosterone injection is not something to be taken lightly. You have to think of all the pathways mm -hmm. testosterone mm -hmm. can be broken mm -hmm. down into. Mm -hmm. And then you have to combine it with quite a holistic mm -hmm. treatment plan. Yeah. Mm. Can you remember what is the, the youngest patient that has gotten testosterone injections from you? I've seen patients in their 30s, but my treatment plan would not be testosterone replacement. Okay. I think the earliest patients would probably be patients in their mid-40s. Mid-40s. Uh, okay. One of the side effects of testosterone would be transient subfertility. Okay. But this, the, this, this transientness, you know, can, mm. can last for months or even right. years, right? So if someone is still planning to start a family, mm. then testosterone replacement would certainly not be my first Something, choice yes. of treatment. Okay. Um, and the other thing would be, you know, when I initiate testosterone treatment for my patients, I will look at their LH and FSH. Okay. Right. So if their LH and FSH is high, that sort of indicates that this is a primary, you know, hypogonadism problem. Yeah. Then testosterone therapy would benefit this patient, right? Okay. All the exercise, all that rest, yeah. all that stress reduction yeah. may not be that helpful. Mm, 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 but mm, if mm. I see a patient who has got very normal LH and FSH, mm. um, then I feel that this patient can actually respond from other options. How about the oldest patient that have gotten testosterone? You know, everybody's very shy. They're like, I'm too young or I'm too old. So what's the oldest? I would not describe too much my oldest patient, <laughs> but, but this is a patient that I have actually met in East Coast Beach when I was young. Oh, really? So when I was a teenager and I was jogging East Coast Beach, mm. I would see this man probably in his 40s, okay. you know, jogging in the beach without his top on and he looks very good. Oh, you know, uh, very can you fit. share which part of East Coast be Beach? Because uh, I don't, don't mind to, going don't there. Don't want to be too specific, <laughs> but now, now he's no longer 40. So class. I can go there and jog tomorrow morning. Yeah. So he walked into my clinic about maybe 10 years ago. Oh, and, okay. And, and, and recognized this guy, right? And recognized this guy, yeah. right? And uh, he was still looking very good for his age, but mm. he's in his 70s now. Yeah. So when we checked, he had got rather low testosterone. Okay. And, I, and after talking to him, I realized that he's still very motivated. Mm. You know, he, at 70 plus, he was still jogging on the beach. Mm. He would still go to the gym and squat and do wow. bench press. Okay. So uh, after the discussion, mm. I started him on testosterone therapy. So he's probably my oldest patient. I think with the testosterone, the men will find it easier to lose mm. weight, right? Yes. Okay. So that shows that just with the lifestyle alone, a man can also change his own testosterone levels. Like if he was exercising, mm. if he never really gained too much weight, mm. then he can actually, um, how to say, not completely prevent, but at least postpone all the mm. onset of yeah, uh, I, I, low testosterone yeah. symptoms. I think if his testis is still capable, his factories mm. are not shut down totally, mm. most, most certainly, right? With, uh, with you know, weight loss, with exercise, okay. with stress reduction, with yeah. adequate rest, yeah. uh, the testosterone levels can be brought up. So, you know, of course, I have a lot of patients who are like so scared of all these injections and medicine. So they ask me things like, is there anything else we can do that can make a man young again? Does Tonkat Ali help? Does mm. herbs like Ashkanda? Mm. Does, mm. Do they help? Can they take that? So again, this morning I was running my clinic mm. and uh, there was a patient who showed me, you know, this supplement. Yeah. And I was telling him that everything in this supplement is supposed to increase testosterone, right? Yeah. So there are lots of supplements. Um, Tonka Ali, one of them, is supposed to increase your testosterone, mm. reduce your uh, SHBG, mm. that uh, globulin that binds your testosterone. Uh, ginseng, ashkawanda, Are zinc. they actually proven to work? They are proven to work. I mean, I'm not too sure how big the studies were, yeah. but they were. They are proven to work. But okay. I feel that um, if you ask me to rate what's the most important, you know, what's the number one, number two, number three ways to boost your testosterone, I would not suggest uh, <laughs> magic food or magic <laughs> supplement, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want to take creatinine, take zinc, <laughs> take tonka ali. Yeah? I would probably still 
go down to the boring basics. Right, mm. right, right. So there's no magic pill and you feel like these supplements, uh, they shouldn't be the mainstay of therapy, right? Mm, they can be the adjunct, they can okay. be concurrent. So you are not against uh, men taking them oh, as no. well? I, I, I prescribe them sometimes. Oh really? Okay. Yes. So what kind of supplements do you usually prescribe your patients? I The one that I carry previously would be zinc. So I'll prescribe okay. them zinc. Um, okay. Occasionally, I would suggest that they take ginseng, especially if you are very stressed. Oh, do you find that ginseng um, helps alleviate the symptoms? I, I, of I think ginseng myself, you know, when okay. I was studying for exams yeah. for that. And um, later on in my medical career, I learned that ginseng belongs is, to this group of uh, herbs known as adaptogens. Mm. And they are supposed to, you know, influence the way your body reacts to stress. Okay. Oh, so mainly very simple, just zinc and ginseng. Yep, I mean there are, there, there is there a whole tons of them, but you list, feel like these uh, are the a whole list. Yeah, whole list, yes. and these are probably the things that the men don't take. They probably take their own multivitamins at mm. home. So mm. these are the rarest ones. Why in particular zinc though? Do you find a lot of men have zinc deficiency? Zinc is found more in shellfish, mm. and I think you know, in the Asian diet, that would probably be not be something that we take on a regular yeah. basis. Uh. Okay. Yeah. Is that what you take yourself? Because you look very fit and uh, mm. alert and obviously young looking. So mm. what, is, uh, what are some of the things I, that you take you can share with us? Well, probably nothing much. Not, nothing to, I mean, so not totally regards, you know, my hormones, but I, I take fish oil. Okay. I take my vitamin Ds. Mm. I take a coenzyme Q10. Okay. And because of my knees and joints, I take glucosamine. Okay, mm. so that is your mainstay. That's my mainstay. And how about exercise-wise, what do you do? This question would have been more interesting <laughs> five years ago. Huh? But, uh, <laughs> I, 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 okay, I always tell my patients, don't tell me what you used to do. Huh? Yeah, but yeah. Uh, what I used to do is I, I would run a couple right. of times a week. I'll go to a gym a couple good, of times you know, a week. That's very good, you know, to run a couple of times. So I will exercise every single day. Right, right. okay, I every single day. I have given up going to the gym. Okay. And I've given up running. I play my tennis as often as I can. But that's more because of the knees. But you still stay fit and active in other ways, maybe, right? Mm, I try to watch my diet. Okay. You know, I, 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 I don't believe that we, are, we need to be that focused yeah. right, if there is no medical issue at hand. Uh, but, I do try to get to a yeah, but I do try to keep to a Mediterranean diet. How about coffee and tea? Do you take coffee and tea? Do you think your patients will take coffee and tea? I, I probably can't do without coffee. Yeah. yeah but... Um, if you Google and read literature, mm. you know, a lot of literature will suggest that, you know, coffee, mm. uh, green tea, mm. mint tea may yeah. reduce your testosterone level. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Mm. So, actually, men shouldn't take too much caffeine then? Pros and cons. Right? Pros and cons, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. if he's not having a testosterone issue, mm. why not? Right? If right. he's having low testosterone, he can address it through other ways. Okay. But if other ways don't work, yeah. then he may want to address his coffee intake. Okay. Yeah. Do you see a lot of men uh, with sleep apnea? I see a lot of obese patients mm. right, because we want a weight loss clinic also. Yeah. Um, and a lot of these, if these obese patients were to complain to me about, you know, tiredness during the day, yeah. you know, waking up suddenly at night, then yes, I would suspect sleep apnea. Okay. Uh, a lot of times from their screening results, I may notice an increase in the hematocrit and then after that, I'll refer them for a sleep test. Sleep test. And usually by losing weight, does that solve most of the problems with sleep apnea? Losing weight helps the problem 100%. Right. right. I, I, had a, I had a patient, yeah. uh, again years back, overweight patient mm. on CPAP, mm. still feeling very tired. Yeah, right? and so CPAP is that continuous pressure uh, yes, machine yes, that right. people wear when they sleep. Yes, okay. Right. Yeah, and then um, when I checked his testosterone, it was low. Okay. But because your hematocrit was high, I couldn't mm. you know suggest any testosterone replacement. Yeah. So we put on a weight loss program. Mm. Um, he is still slightly chubby, but he's no longer tired. How much right? weight did he lose to get to Probably where he is? Probably five to, to ten. That's actually yeah. quite good. How, yeah. how he's still long? chubby now. <laughs> yeah. But how long did it take him to lose 5 to 10? Long, probably a year. Probably That's a year. not bad, you I, know. I, 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 I don't yeah, think I can yeah. lose 10 kg in a year. That's mm. quite consistent. I, I think we must do... Like 1 you know, kg a month for yeah, 10 we, months. We, we must do what we are capable of doing, right? Mm. I, mean, I mean, you know, the food that we choose, you know, yes. is it something that we will enjoy on a long-term basis? True. You know, it, uh, I always tell my patients that, you know, weight loss is not a program. Yeah. Weight loss, weight loss is your decision they are going to make for the rest of your life, right? Yeah, so you must be something yeah. doable. So what did he do in his program or protocol? Mm. I advise him to go on a Mediterranean diet. Okay. And uh, cutting off the carbos. Okay. And increasing his resistance training and trying to go for walks. That's right. it? That's all he did and that helped him lose no medicine. <laughs> that was before the days of, you know, Ozempic and Zazenda. Yeah. 
so I prescribe him Duramin. Okay. I, I used to prescribe a lot of Duramin. Yeah. I, I think it works on two levels. Duramin suppresses the appetite very well, mm. and Duramin makes you very energetic. Right. You know, so you can have a person who skips his breakfast, skips his lunch, yeah. has a little bit of dinner, and then can go for uh, you know one two hour tennis. Yeah. So Duramin is uh, the appetite. Uh, suppressant, phantomin, mm -hmm. and um, do you find that people get a bit of uh, insomnia with that? I think that oh, was one of the main complaints. Yeah. So I think I think one of the advice that I give my patients on duramin mm. uh, previously was that they would number one take duramin on days when they can afford to diet. Okay. So if I've got a social lunch or I got a social then, dinner, then yeah. don't bother with duramin, yeah. right? Because it's associated with certain side effects. Yeah. The other thing that I would advise them would be you know try to coordinate your exercise days on your duramin days okay right because you will need to work off that excess energy okay to be able to sleep well the night okay mm. and but after about three months on duramin do people find that the weight sort of like plateaus they kind of like get used to the mm -hmm. weight, weight loss regardless of whether you're on duramin or you know any other weight tends to plateau right mm. and it just means that you got to work harder yeah you know than what you're already doing okay and if they take duramin do they take it alone or do you uh, maybe prescribe it with some other medicine in and I occasionally suggest that they take melatonin, mm, right? So you, you take your duramin and then you take yeah, melatonin okay. to help you sleep. Yeah. Right? Mm. After all, melatonin, I believe, is sort of anti-aging anyway. So yeah. Mm. Melatonin is a few good hormone, right? Yeah. You, you, when it gets dark, your body produces yeah. melatonin, you sleep, you feel happy. You know? okay. But now with all these newer weight loss drugs, do you mm. employ them? Like, you know, yes. Sexenda? I, I, I do use Sexenda in the clinic. Mm. Um, I find that it's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. I, I always so Sasenda is a daily injectable, it's a daily right? Injectable. Uh, is lira glutide? Is yes, lira right. glutide? Yeah. And then the other one will be Ozempic. Huh? So these these medications work very well. They they suppress your appetite by you know working on your leptin granulin hormone pathway. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other effect of you know these drugs is that they tend to slow down your gut motility. Okay. So when it slows down your gut motility, you feel a little bloated. Mm. and a little bit of food and, and that's it. I think with Sexender, which is the daily injections, I think it's good if the patients have a lot of side effects of insomnia, but they really complain of a lot of gastrointestinal discomfort, nausea, some even mm. vomiting, so mm. that's a bit hard. I think, I think the two most annoying side effects, mm. you know, that my patients will voice out to me would be, you know, nausea, heartburn, mm. right? And the other one would be, you know, constipation. Ah, yeah. okay. Yeah, that, that would... Duramin would also give you constipation. Much lesser. Much lesser. Yeah, you keep yourself okay. hydrated, much lesser. Right, okay. So these are the mainstay, not, no other magic bullet you're hiding for weight for loss. Your, yeah, for weight loss. Oh, I, I guess there are a lot of different weight loss medications in the market, right? Yeah, Including but the Zen, ones that Zenical, you, yeah. Zenical. Do, right? do people still use Zenical? Uh, I, I think it's... I, not, 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 <laughs> not, the people, not the doctors that I know. Yeah. But yeah, Zenical used to be quite popular. Yes, right? but you personally in your practice, I, I use really it and then patients complain, complain of yeah. you know, accidents. Yeah, yeah. accidents. Mm. Because they prevent the oil from being absorbed, so there mm. tends to be a lot of accidents. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. So mainly Duramin at Sexenda. And how long would your patients be on each of these medicines before for they For Duramin I try not to put them on Duramin for too long, mm. right? You can be a little bit mentally addicted yeah. to the effect. Yeah. Um and then sometimes after you stop it if you after prolonged use, you may feel a little bit depressed even. Oh, okay. So usually not more than three months. Okay. Right? Yeah. Or if the patient is taking it on an ad hoc basis, yeah. then maybe more than three months. More, so, but, but, but not, not continuous. Yes, not yes, continuous. Yes. Yeah. For Sazenda, I've uh, put patients on Sazenda for one year, two years. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they, they still lose weight? You have to keep increasing the dose, right? Sometimes, you know, a lot of my patients after the initial weight loss, mm. they may not be injecting Sazenda on a daily basis. Again, ad hoc, so yeah, maintain, hoc. Yeah. yeah. That's right. How about all these other things I hear about? Intermittent fasting, water fasting, do you use them and are they useful? Mm -hmm. I think intermittent fasting works on two levels, right? Mm. I mean, if I were to eat one meal a day, yeah. you know, unless I'm a glutton, my that one meal a day is probably <sighs> going to be lesser than three meals yes. a day, right? So it works on that that level. Yes. And uh, on the other level, you'll be on more of a hormonal level, you know, okay. in increasing your insulin sensitivity. So you do you, you do actually put some of your patients on intermittent fasting or not? I intermittent fast myself. Oh, okay. Not 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 very strictly. Okay. <laughs> I will have a cup of coffee black. In the morning, okay. I would skip lunch sometimes. So is it a twelve lunch. hour, eight yeah, hour? Yeah, it's around that. So it's a uh, eating within a eight hour window and yeah. fasting for twelve hours. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what? 
how about other fasting strategies? Have you heard of people who do something like uh, like three day fast or the every other day they mm. fast one mm. day or even drinking fruit juice for a while? Yes, you know, yes. I, I I feel that some, that uh, a weight loss diet or weight loss decision mm. has to be doable lifelong and something that you can maintain yes, right yes you know? so i i suppose if you were to fast for three days you mm. know you may have some water loss mm. you know but uh, the actual fat loss may not be that significant okay mm. yeah so for men who are aging can you maybe give us some tips for them to maintain uh, sort of like you know their testosterone levels and mm -hmm. for them to stay as young and healthy mm. As possible. Start young. I think it's important to start young. Okay. Right. Start young. Uh, By starting young, you mean starting to take care of your health when mm, young? That means exercising, uh, getting enough rest, you know, managing your weight from young. And then if they haven't started young and they're already in their 40s, mm. what, what kind of tips can the, you there, give? There are lots of men, right? Who, yeah. who you know, middle-age crisis and then they yeah. join a marathon and all that. So, so it's also very doable. Really? Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I think at any stage in life, I would not tell a patient who's 70 years old that there is no lifestyle changes that will help his you know his his well-being yeah. but it's just the effect would probably be less uh, less dramatic okay mm. but even at whatever age as long as they commit to exercise and weight loss mm. they can still um, get the best years ahead right mm. sort of mm. yeah I, I think exercise in your golden years has to be a little bit more careful Mm. Right, you know, mm. if you have certain issues, joint mm. issues, then there are certain exercises that you may not want to do. So yeah, because you know, I do see a lot of middle-aged men uh, riding bicycles around town mm. in mm. Uh, tight lycra. Mm. So yes. that is uh, mm. that is a <laughs> and form. sometimes a little overweight also. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So mm. that is a, a lot of things that yeah. uh, middle-aged men do. Yes. They, they so I would advise these men to, besides you know, <laughs> Don't wearing wear so tight. their <laughs> tight lycra <laughs> and cycling. Like, I mean, cycling burns calories. Yes. I'm sure, right. Um, it also depends on what you do after the cycling. You know, session. Mm. You sit down with your friends and have a nice meal with beer. You know, if you do that, then that defeats the purpose. But um, like I mentioned, I think for exercise, one needs to concentrate on muscle building and yes. muscle maintenance. Also. Yeah. So, ex so cycling may have less benefits, especially on the upper body musculature. Yeah. So the cy cycling may not provide enough resistance training yes. for the men to build yeah. muscle. So right. it shouldn't be their only exercise, right? right? Okay. But is it a good exercise for middle-aged men to lose weight? Yes, I think um, if you know if they can cycle, then I, th I think that cycling would probably be a gentler exercise. Okay. Uh, compared to running on the knees. On the knees, yeah. Because yeah. a lot of men do get issues as they get older. So mm. the main complaint is the knee issues. Mm. Yeah. How about swimming? Is that a good exercise? First of all, you need to know how to swim, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, and, not, and not everyone knows how to swim. But yeah. if you know how to swim, then yes, I think swimming would be a, another very you know useful op option yeah. and alternative. Okay. The the only problem regards swimming in comparison to running is that uh, I mean you need a pool, mm. and I think number two, you know, it is not weight bearing. Yeah, it's not right? weight bearing. So it may not address the osteoporosis that tends to hinder one's well being in our old age. Right? Okay, mm. okay, yeah. Well, so that has been very enlightening. Is there any last words you need to tell our listeners? Anything on um, keeping young for men? Keeping young. Start young. Start young. I think start young. Yeah. Start young. I think that's very good advice. Yeah. Mm, start young. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Derek. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Men Up to Andropause, Myths, Facts and Solutions. We hope you found the discussion informative and empowering. A big thank you to Dr. Derek Koh for sharing his expertise and shedding light on this important topic. Remember, understanding andropause and managing its symptoms is a crucial part of healthy aging. If you have any questions or would like to learn more, please don't hesitate to reach out to us or consult with your healthcare provider. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast for more episodes on health, wellness and aging. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review and share it with others who might benefit from this information. Until next time, this is Dr. Lo Chai Ling wishing you health and happiness. Take care.